My tiny second daughter was born on a boiling hot day in the middle of January three years ago. Amid the endless patting, rocking and all-night feeding of a precious newborn, I became the subject of an orchestrated online hate campaign. The reason why I became the target of trolls is a harrowing one, and it goes right to the core of who I am. Back in June 2010, I was ABC Local Radio's Drive presenter based in Cairns in far north Queensland. As a journalist, I've always been interested in social justice. I've always been asking myself the questions of how we treat each other. How can society be fairer? So I decided to put together a special radio and online series on the subject of gender. I started doing research and found evidence that if you are gay, bisexual or transgender, you are more likely to experience all kinds of disadvantages in life, including being homeless, being subject to violence, having depression and having suicidal thoughts. This seemed to me to be an important untold story. So I put a call out for people who had stories to share and received a flood of emails in response, many of them documenting personal stories which were both harrowing, frightening and awful. As part of the interviews I compiled for the Gender Project, I found myself on the doorstep of a lovely home in Kawara Beach in Kansas northern suburbs. Now I can remember pulling up outside this house like it was yesterday. It was a modern style home painted off white with a manicured garden and out the front a child's bike was on its side. At the door I was met warmly by gay dads Mark Newton and Peter Truong. You may have seen this photo. It was used by news organisations all over the world once these two men became big news. And it's very strange for me to look at it now because I took this as a happy snap on that humid Cairns day in the garden of the home that I just mentioned. You'll also see here that the child's face is blocked out to protect his identity. And if not for that, I would love to show you his sweet little face so that you can see he is a person and not a number. Mark Newton and Peter Truong introduced me to their gorgeous five-year-old son, who for legal reasons will now be called Boy One. Boy One was told to go off and watch a DVD while I recorded an interview with his two dads. Mark Newton and Peter Truong then proceeded to tell me how they had longed to become fathers and how, after a difficult journey, ended up having Boy One via a surrogate mother in Russia five years earlier. Newton was the biological dad, they told me. This turned out to be untrue. Boy One was actually purchased from his Russian mother for 8,000 US dollars. Even though nothing about the story set alarm bells ringing at the time, and at the time the men had no police record, I was not unquestioning about the situation. During the interview, the two men told me that it had been incredibly hard to get Boy One into Australia and that authorities had repeatedly questioned them. At this point in the interview, I asked them something that in retrospect seems uncanny. What was the concern, I asked. Were authorities worried that something paedophilic was going on? Newton replied, absolutely, absolutely. I'm sure that was completely the concern. My recollection of this moment is that both men were smiling. After the interview, we went outside because boy one wanted to show me his baby chickens. We chased the chickens round the yard and made idle conversation. Absolutely ordinary. Except that it wasn't. In February 2012, I learned that Mark Newton and Peter Truong were being investigated by the United States Postal Inspection Service and the Queensland Police as members of a possible international paedophile ring. And in case you're wondering, the United States Postal Inspection Service is just like the FBI, but they investigate crimes committed by post. Now, I'm a seasoned journalist, and I knew almost straight away there must be serious reasons to suspect these two men. Otherwise, why would international policing agencies be cooperating on the case? I hoped it wasn't true, but I thought it probably was, and I felt incredibly ill. On Friday, the 28th of June, 2013, Mark Newton was sentenced to 40 years in a US prison for conspiring to sexually exploit a child, boy one, and another count for conspiring to possess child pornography. 
Peter Truong has also pleaded guilty for his crimes and received 30 years in a US prison. You cannot underestimate the horror of these crimes. Media reports stated that Boy Wan had been abused by these two criminals from the time he was just two weeks old. Media reports also stated that he had been shared around with other paedophiles in other countries while their family was on holiday. Immediately after Mark Newton was sentenced, I started to get scores of hateful tweets, many of them from people in the United States calling themselves conservatives. They were responding to the article that I had written three years earlier, which was still online. Many of them were inciting others to shame her, shame her. My trolls insisted that somehow I should have known what was going on behind closed doors. The barrage of tweets was quickly followed by a number of extremely demeaning and defamatory blog posts. I was called a dimwit, an incompetent, a paedophile lover and enabler, and a propagandist for the gay rights movement. At this point, I do need to say that the real victim here is not me or my family. It's the child who was abused by these two men from the time he was a tiny baby. And even now, I think of him often, and I wonder how his life will turn out. And perhaps I'll never know the end of that story. What I can tell you, though, is what happened to me next. Late one night, I received a tweet that said, your life is over. My husband and I quickly realized that location services was turned on on my Twitter feed and that you could just about pinpoint our house on Google Maps. That night, we both lay awake wondering if our two little girls were in danger. The second frightening moment occurred six days after Newton was sentenced. My husband found a photo of our family on a fascist website. In the photo, I'm heavily pregnant with our second child and our older daughter is sitting on my husband's shoulders. It's an incredibly eerie feeling to find a photo of your family taken with love for the purposes of a family Christmas card in such a hateful location. The fascist website called me a bitch and derided the way that I look. And this seemed all the more sinister because my mother's parents were Jews who fled the Holocaust and this was a Nazi hate website. There was no way to know if the trolls meant actual harm. We just had to sit and wait. Well, that was three years ago and things looked different over time. Over time, the fear subsided enough for curiosity to take hold. Who were these trolls? What did they want? Plenty of people speculate about internet trolls, but I wanted to know for sure. I wanted to go directly to the source and write about them. And I did. Serious internet trolls are not as hard to find as you might imagine. In fact, they seem to be hiding in plain sight. And perhaps even stranger, they really wanted to talk to me. Not a bit, but a lot. They wanted to explain how and why they hurt other people. The trolls were nastier and more dangerous than I had imagined. Let me tell you about a troll who chose a pseudonym, Mark. Mark started trolling Facebook memorial pages at the age of 14. He loved the pain he could cause the family members of the person who had died. For example, he'd go onto the wall of a young girl who had died by suicide and write that she clearly couldn't handle the shame of being such an immense slut any longer. The internet being the way it is, Mark found other like-minded trolls and started acting with accomplices. He carefully researched each victim and tried to find their weakest point. Depending on who he was trying to troll, his comments could be racist or violent. He'd troll rape victims and say that rape is always okay. He'd threaten women by saying he'd harm their children. On the one hand, Mark told me he wasn't misogynist. On the other, he said women were weaker and easier to hurt. On one phone call, Mark boasted that it can get pretty real life. When I asked him what he meant, he hesitated before proceeding to tell me that he and his accomplices actively tried to incite vulnerable people to harm themselves and even to suicide. If there is any doubt in your mind about the real life damage that trolls can do, just think of television personality Charlotte Dawson. Charlotte died by suicide two years ago, and many people saw online bullies as a significant factor in her death. 
There is nothing virtual about this. Mark also told me he was involved in swatting. This is the act of deceiving emergency responders into thinking that there is a hostage situation or murder taking place. If successful, it may cause a victim's door to be kicked in in the middle of the night by police with guns. Mark was a narcissist, and this overrode concerns about his own safety. He wanted everyone to know how and why he hurt others and didn't care if the police caught him, and in fact, suspected that eventually they would. Mark still keeps an intermittent contact with me. A message will come out of the blue to make a comment or ask a question. And if I don't respond to his foul tweets, he'll become surly. He'll remind me that if I had misquoted him while writing my articles, he would have fucked up my life. Last year, Mark tweeted me to say, fuck Jews, and told me that the Holocaust never occurred. We are never going to agree, I replied, adding that members of my own family were killed Gassed, in fact, in the Holocaust. Gassed in what, he replied, the non-existent gas chambers? Trolls are not all the same. Their reasons for trolling are complex, varied and changeable. They don't fit into neat ideas of misogyny, racism or any other kind of hate. For example, another troll I met during my research, Craig, described himself as a political troll. He trolled other people while sticking very tightly to his own particular ethical framework. He never ever trolled on the basis of gender and didn't believe this was acceptable. He told me that he was far left and that he usually stuck to trolling other lefties who, in his view, were not left enough. <laughs> I've noticed another kind of troll too, a sort of garden variety troll, if you like, who usually is quite a nice person, but somehow from behind his or her computer screen becomes aggressive and nasty and like a dog with a bone keeps hounding their victim. The trolls I spoke to did have some commonalities. They were not unemployed hermits sitting alone in their bedrooms as you may think, but instead middle class blokes with jobs and girlfriends and they trolled in gangs too. Sometimes these gangs were very tightly organised and they documented the hounding of their victims online. Other times, they were far looser. Most trolls I spoke to were happy to claim the label of sadist. And this dovetails right into research from the University of British Columbia that found that internet trolling correlates strongly with the so-called dark tetrad of personality traits, that is, Machiavellianism, psychopathy, narcissism, and sadism. But it is sadism that has the strongest link. This means that trolls want to hurt and humiliate others and derive pleasure from it. I am often asked to speak to young women about their careers, and inevitably the question of online abuse comes up. What I usually tell those young women about social media is this. Forewarned is forearmed. Know that if you are going to go into the kitchen, you will get burnt. But I have come to believe that this is not enough. I do not accept that if my young daughters one day go online, they will be threatened with rape and murder. There is a moral imperative to stop ourselves and others being harmed online just as there is offline. If we think of the internet as a city, none of us want to walk the streets of a place where we feel threatened and humiliated and afraid. Just as civil society exists outside these doors, so too must it exist on the internet. We need to reclaim the cyber streets. This is easier said than done. How do we do it? My proposal is both a mixture of action and inaction. The action comes from our broader society and it involves creating a framework that makes us safe. If I choose to walk down to the local mall right now, the likelihood is that I'll do this safely. This is because most of us follow the laws and we understand that violence against others is unacceptable. So too must society accept that internet trolling is a form of violence that can harm you or me or any of us and in fact inflict trauma on us. 
laws exist to stop internet trolls menacing and harassing others, and law enforcement agencies must be willing to investigate and prosecute offenders. Similarly, social media companies must protect users from harm by implementing watertight policies for reporting and blocking trolls. And there are some positive signs in this direction. Workplaces must also see this as an occupational health and safety issue. They must take cyber attacks on staff seriously and implement social media self-defense training. And with this safety framework in place, I'm now going to propose something radical, and it represents a very recent evolution in my thinking on this issue. I'm going to propose an inaction, and I don't suggest this lightly. I'm mouthy, <laughs> I've grown up talking my way through things, like right now. I'm also a social justice journalist, and in my work I'm usually hoping to incite people to action, to stand up and be counted, and loudly speak out. But what if, when it comes to internet trolls, our social media superpower is actually to say nothing. What if, when it comes to internet trolling, Mahatma Gandhi's notion of non-violent resistance is actually the best option? What do we know about trolls? They are sadists. They go out to hurt you. They find your weakest point. They desperately want a reaction and, in fact, rely on your wounded, angry response to ply their trade. So imagine if the next time you or I is labelled a fat slut or a fucking Jew or a paedophile lover online, we refuse to be afraid. We turn off the notifications on our phone for a little while and put the kettle on for a cup of tea. And then we go right back to whatever it was we were doing before that, effectively excluding the trolls from civil society. I need to be clear, this is not retreating in fear, but staying right here where you are. It's strong. Perhaps in this age of 24-hour news and information, amid the river of noise and opinion and reaction, our social media superpower is actually silence. <laughs>